Hey, what's going on, everybody? Today, I have the pleasure of chatting with American singer-songwriter NBC The Voice Season 24 contestant Allison Albrecht. In this newest episode, Allison opens up about her battles with mental health, being musically influenced by Carole King, Aretha Franklin, Taylor Swift, current vinyl collection, and more, as well as her thoughts on Reba McIntyre's Tater Tots plus barbecue sauce. Now, with that being said, hope you enjoy my conversation with Allison. Hello, Allison. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I mean, it's it, it's it's got to be crazy to to have people pronounce your name in, in, in all sorts of different ways, because I was like, how do you pronounce your last name? And I'm like, I'm looking at the interviews that you were doing in the past, and I was like, is it Albrecht or is it Albrecht? It's um, Albrecht is how I say it. Yeah, it's okay. a German. That's, that's interesting. I was like, the it, it's so fascinating when you come across people with certain last names, which is like, you don't know how to pronounce it correctly, so you try your best at at, at like attempting it. Um, and if if it, and if it sounds off, it's like the most hilarious thing ever. Um, I mean, um, before we even talk about, I guess your music, I, I want to talk about. So you're just coming off the voice stage. Mm-hmm. Um, we saw your knockout performance uh, last night, um, and you're performing. Um, it's too late by carol king yeah. um what what was going through your mind in, in in sort of that round specifically because you know like it's it's basically like a three-way knockout um and it's it's a very competitive thing to be able to go up against two other people yeah um but you've also created that friendship with those people along the way and during this competition what was it like to to perform that song but also feeling that energy throughout the same at the same time, I guess. Um, yeah, I think the knockouts definitely elevated the competition to another level. Only one out of the three would proceed um, by by selection. So of course there were steals and saves out there, but really only one was guaranteed to move on. So I knew that the stakes were higher, but I also really focused on just giving my best performance because I knew no matter the outcome. I was already on the show. I'd already been on some episodes. And what I really wanted throughout my experience in The Voice was to expose my music to a broad range of listeners. I wanted to grow as an artist. I wanted to collaborate with the fellow artists and work with the production team and my coach, Reba. So I really feel like what was going through my mind was just delivering the best performance possible, not attached to any outcome. Of course, um, it would have been great to have won and gotten through that round but at the same time i i feel like it was a win with how the performance went and i really just tried to stay present in the moment for sure and um uh errol king who's had tons of hits um with um of course her uh signature uh song that she wrote for uh that uh, that was on her album tapestry um yeah. uh you make me feel like a natural woman who was covered also uh, most popular known by uh, Aretha Franklin, um, the queen of, I guess they would call her the queen of Motown. Um, and, and she knows it really well and the ins and outs of the music industry. But I guess also growing up in the motor town yourself, I guess, in, in mm-hmm. terms of uh, Birmingham, Michigan, um, how much of sort of that specific type of music sort of influenced your upbringing, I guess? Yeah, I think the music scene in Detroit is incredible. Um, the not only the Motown roots, but the current music that's out there in Detroit is unbelievable. So I feel so blessed to have grown up in such a great music city. Um, and being from Detroit, Motown really is abundant everywhere. So um, growing up listening to those songs and that songwriting, those incredible artists, it's unbelievable what they did and what they do. And I was in music business classes in undergrad and we studied Motown and we studied about how that all came to be. And it really influenced my artistry and uh, my music business as well. Of course. And um, I mean, if you could, I guess, like, pinpoint sort of like one artist specifically or or a couple of artists and 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 songs that you were influenced growing up what would they be Mm. i really love carol king she's an incredible songwriter that's why i chose to sing one of her songs i also love sarah borellis she's been 
one of my inspirations throughout my whole life. Not only is she a great songwriter, but I also uh, grew up doing theater as my vocal training. So she went on and wrote a Broadway musical and has done so much throughout her career. So I love her. I also learned how to songwrite from Taylor Swift. I love Stevie Nicks. I love modern day Maggie Rogers. I really feel like I'm influenced by a blend of older classic songwriters combined with modern uh, modern pop, modern pop folk type sounds. That's so interesting that you say Taylor Swift, because when I was listening to some of your music, um, I was like, there's definitely some styles in there, which sort of gives you the hints of uh, the early Taylor Swift era. Um, plus, like, there's also that influence of of the Motown records that you're yeah. talking about, uh, which is really interesting. Uh, but those those songs that you release are very personal uh, songs that that hold such a storytelling ability in, in terms of, I guess, your your vocal abilities. Um I guess there was there was the one song um, that uh, that you released. I think your most recent song it was, and it was White Tab. Um, mm-hmm. And the the cover art for for that single, I was kind of caught off guard with that. I was like, what does that cover art sort of stand for in terms of, I guess I guess how you sort of put it out there in terms of the the, I don't know how to really describe this because like, it's sort of this just. This is plain picture of 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 a of a white tab and and sort of this I don't know this medication thing. Um, can you talk to me about that cover art sort of because I want to get a really good idea of of what you're trying to uh, attempt there I guess. Yeah, so I ended up writing that song about my decision to take medication for my mental health and it's a really difficult decision to make. I didn't realize that some of those. Um, things I was struggling with ran in my family. And a lot of times, if there is a genetic component, uh, medication really can help you. Not only if there is, of course, there might be reasons to take medication, even if you don't have a family history, but especially if there is, it can be very beneficial. So I found that I was struggling with things that I'd been in therapy for months and I really had this hill that I needed to get over uh, and was struggling to do that without an additional support. And so I had a doctor that suggested I take a really low dose of a a mental health medication and it absolutely helped me sleep. It helped me have, I had a lot of stomach issues because our gut they say is our second brain. And so I had a lot of issues that were biological, that medication really helped me clear up. And I really felt so vulnerable taking that medication. I felt a little bit of shame attached to it also. And what really made me feel comfortable taking it and taking charge of my health was talking to my friends who had had the similar issues and taken the same medication or something in the same family. And I wanted to write that song and put it out there and be so open and honest about it because I knew that maybe somebody doesn't have a friend that they could talk to about it. And maybe they didn't have a trusted adult or somebody to counsel about that decision. So of course, medication needs to be individual. You should consult your doctor and really think about your own personal situation. It's not for everybody, but I really do believe that it's important to take charge of your health. And I wrote that song to bring light to that really heavy topic. Yeah, and and if 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 you don't mind me asking, because you were just talking about sort of the the hills that you were sort of going through, uh, what are those hills that you're referring to? If if you don't mind me asking, yeah, I mean I can go into it a little bit. I really struggled with anxiety and depression throughout college specifically, but it had really persisted throughout my whole life. Even as a young child, I had stomach aches. I would have really bad um, stomach problems and heart racing, and felt really anxious in different situations and had felt depressed throughout different times in my life. But when I was in college, it got to a point where it was really debilitating to where I couldn't do schoolwork. I lost interest in things that brought me joy and I really needed help and intervention. And I'm so grateful that I received it. I was able to go to therapy. I was able to work with a team of doctors, um, but not everybody has that. And I feel so grateful. And that's really something that I hope to do with my life and career has improved the accessibility of mental health support services. 
And if you also don't mind me asking, if there was a message that you would send to people who are dealing with the certain issues that you're dealing with or just mental health in general, what would you want to say to them? I would say that everything is temporary. It won't last forever. But when you're in it, it feels like it will. And I just think one of the most important things to do is let somebody else in and tell somebody, of course, if you don't trust somebody, they're not worthy of hearing your story, but find somebody that you can trust, find somebody that has your best interest at heart and don't shut people out because that's going to be your lifeline. For sure. And uh, I, I mean, I also want to carry this this topic into talking about also the voice because the voice carries a lot of those emotions where sort of when you're when you're riding on such a high um, and you're excited and you're sort of going through this, the, the motion of, I guess, the thrill of it all, I guess, if, if that makes sense in, in terms of, of the competition wise and going through that sort of brings that emotion of stress. There's the frustration part. There's the part where you you start thinking to your you start thinking in your head that am I capable of doing this? Am I capable of, of holding out even longer than I can? Um, and these thoughts run through your mind, and and you keep thinking about it, and you keep thinking about it, and eventually, I, I guess it it's sort of that's when it breaks. You know, that's that's when it starts to to make you wonder that maybe I'm not worthy of this, maybe I'm not capable of this, maybe I should just go home and and. And just go back to doing what I what I was used to doing. Um, when those moments sort of arrive, um, how do you sort of make yourself feel like you can cope with, cope through it all, um, while at the same time feeling feeling like yourself? I think one thing about the voice was I am really grateful. I always wanted to be there. I feel like even though I had, I looked around at all these talented people and was like, gosh, how could I be in this pool? I really had to find that confidence and be like, no, I feel like I've worked for this for so many years. I've been performed since I was seven or eight years old and been writing songs nearly as long. And uh, yeah. And I think it wasn't necessarily the neg. I don't know. I really just think the voice brought different challenges. It made me think about my artistry and think about uh, the ways that I needed to improve. And I think maybe that was my frustration was, oh, I feel like there's a mountain to climb of so many things that I want to work on and improve on. But at the same time, I really was grounded and found such gratitude in being there. And um, yeah, I don't know. That's sort of what was going through my head during the voice. Yeah. And I, I guess, um, bringing this conversation now into sort of um, your whole experience on the voice, what did it teach you? Um, what did, what did you take away from this experience? Well, one of the biggest takeaways was I moved to LA when I was 22, just graduated from college. So a little over a year ago to pursue music as my full-time job. And the fact that I was on the voice and got so much affirmation from this experience just showed me that this is the career path that I should be pursuing. And I almost went to grad school. I wanted to work in research and pursue academic paths, which is what I did in college. But I really thought about what that career path would look like. And I didn't think that it would really fulfill me in the way that pursuing music would, which was my lifelong love was performing and writing. So I think it was affirming that this is what I should be doing. And the other takeaway was just ways to sing without my own songs and without an instrument because my whole career I'm a songwriter so I'd been writing my own music performing majority my own music at different showcases and venues not only in LA but also in Detroit and I'm not a wedding band singer so I never really had the experience of just myself and a mic on the stage singing hours and hours of covers and the people that have and people on the show have had multiple levels of experience and they're all incredibly talented but I really looked at those people who sang covers for a living and I'm like oh you are seasoned you know and of course I don't necessarily want to be in a wedding band or corporate band as my full-time career long term but I really do think some of those skills that you learn about really getting with a crowd and owning that stage those are things where I'm like okay I could really that the voice taught me how to do that because I was 
I know how to really engage an audience with my own music and a guitar and sharing stories and being vulnerable, but learning this new skill was, was really out of my comfort zone and really positive. Uh, of course. And, and, um, you know, you sort of, you came on the voice, um, and you, you, you stepped on stage for the first time and you opened, you opened with, um, ironic by Lance Morissette, um, and sort of this, this, I guess this thought kicked in, uh, and, and I, I want to read a quote that you actually said about your experience on the voice and sort of, I guess the blind audition specifically, because you said, you know, every single person I've, I've ever known would, would see this audition. And I think it pushed me out of my comfort zone in the best way. It really scared me. Um, but like, I guess now, as we're talking about this whole experience on, on the competition and, and, and the show in general, sort of how did sort of this whole journey um, sort of push you now more than, you know, when you look back on that first audition and then you look back on this recent uh, performance on, on the knock, knockout rounds, how do you, how do you look at your whole journey as, as a whole, I guess? Well, I have so much gratitude for the whole journey. I think I've, the blind audition, I was extremely nervous for. I knew I was performing in front of the coaches and it was being filmed and there's truly I don't think anything I've done music wise, that's been more scary than that. So to be able to conquer that was such a huge feat. Um, but I just think I continued getting more comfortable throughout the whole experience. And what I really feel grateful for is that people have seen my passion for music, my love of performing just shine through because I love connecting with audiences, telling the emotion of a song. And that's what people got from my performances. So I think this really pushed me out of my comfort zone to perform on such a elevated stage, but it really is what I've always wanted to be doing. So it felt so purposeful and and right to be there. Certainly, and and I guess the the whole the whole journey in, in Pacific has has been really life changing for you. But at the same time, when you're looking back at the performance that you did in the battle rounds um, with Angelina um, performing, you say by Lauren Daigle. That sort of uh, that sort of performance when I'm watching you both perform it, it seems like you sort of felt this whole calm, just just calm. It's you know it's not like you're you're doing some crazy runs and and stuff like that. It's sort of just you're still in the moment, and that's what Reba said as well. It's it's how you convey that emotion, and if you can convey that emotion to your audience, um, then you have a career. But if you if you if you don't have the capability of of showing an, an emotion, it's just a song. Um, how much of her advice sort of helped you sort of navigate this whole competition in a positive manner? I guess so much. She gave me such incredible advice, and her advice about connection and harnessing the energy you feel from the butterflies before a performance and just using that to take your performance to a new level was so helpful. And yeah, just limiting move. She really was emphasizing in a lot of songs, not moving so much. You're really conveying the emotion and not getting swept away in movement, but rather delivering the best vocal performance possible. And I really will remember what she said forever. And hopefully, you know, we'll continue my relationship with her as well. I know I will. And must I ask uh, about uh, about Reba's tater tots that she gives out during the uh, the audition process? Uh, tell us, uh, rate it one to five tater tots for Reba. Oh, I'll rate it a five. Five, it's unbelievable. They were actually so good. And I remember I complimented her. I'm like, wait, the sauce is actually good because you know they could be like hit or miss. But her sauce was what put it over the edge she got really good like barbecue sauce to dip them in well i guess i guess we when when i guess us as the audience sort of watches the voice we we don't see the i guess the sauces that she uses with the tater tots no. all we see is the tater tots um yeah. so i guess now we've gotten exclusive behind the scenes from you to to say behind... that we can confirm that it is barbecue sauce that she has been given out to people you heard it here first yeah she has a special barbecue sauce that is pretty pretty excellent. Okay, so I, I I guess we can we can just confirm that Reba's um uh, guaranteed barbecue sauce is is up there in terms of one of the best ones that you've had. Um, yeah. 
but I also want to have some fun here because I, I, I know, I guess being also a musician comes with collecting a lot of records. Um, I don't know if you, I don't know if you collect records. Do you collect records? I, you know, I have a few, I don't have a ton. Um, my boyfriend just moved and he has boxes and boxes and boxes. So, um, he has a huge collection. I do have a few records, but, uh, but you know, I love listening to all different albums and stuff like that. If you, if you don't mind, would you be able to share some of those records of, of what those records are? Yeah, I have um, Fleetwood Mac Rumors, which is one of my favorite albums of all time. Uh, I have Tapestry, Carol King, and I have Midnight's Taylor Swift. Those are my three records that I own. So, of course, that there, there's there been a, a, a Tapestry album in there as well. Um, yeah. Funny thing about the Tavistry album, because I recently went record shopping. Um, I went record shopping and I was looking at, um, we have a Valley Village here in, in, in Canada. Um, and I go there and I'm looking at all the records that they have there. Then I come across on the bottom shelf, there's a there's a record that says Carol King on it. And I look at the Carol King album and it's a Tavistry album. Now here's the negative part about that. It's always the worst thing when you find a record that you're like do you know how much value this album carries you know do you really understand the value of carol king's records and i go there i check out this record and i'm like it better have a cd in it it better mm -hmm. have a cd in it it did not have a cd in it and i was like oh my gosh it's just a cover yeah. someone just left the cover behind it took the cd and i'm like that is that is just like I don't know I don't know I just I just don't have like I I don't like when people do that you know just like if if you're either gonna take the CD take the cover art with it because you know like what's the point of like disappointing other people when they find that you just took the CD and left the cover behind um, because the cover also has the barcode in it which you have to scan to pay you with so I don't know if someone just like took it out of out of anything sounds and, like they just kind of snatched it yeah uh, but i mean um i guess in terms of records i have like tons of records i have like I think about what 36 records um and um i guess some of them were uh beetle records um sergeant peppers revolver um frank sinatra I, I don't know i really like the oldies a lot more like in terms of bing crosby as well i found a bing crosby record which is really cool um yeah so i guess that's that's really like the the premise of in terms of my record collection but it's interesting that you say taylor swift too because we have to also talk about taylor uh herself because she's making billions of dollars let me just say um and 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 it's not like it's not like i hate taylor swift and i'm not i'm not calling her out and i'm not saying that she's a horrible artist i think what she's doing is a smart business plan um and if you want to criticize her, criticize her. But she's using the business techniques to the highest level. And she's doing it all in the right ways. You know, she's not only making the billions of dollars through her merchandise, which is just one whole another level itself. She's also taking it by also her documentary that she released uh, about her uh, Eros Tour film uh, that has taken the world by storm. Her Eros Tour in specific. Um, her meet and greets, all of that, her bus people, her band, uh, her whole set list, the whole design of the stages. Um, and you go on and you just go through the list. I mean, do you have a favorite Taylor Swift song? Song? I don't, um, gosh. I mean, the first one that comes to mind is Clean, which I really love that one. Um, but no, I don't necessarily have a favorite song. I've been, I mean, I was, I think, six when her first album came out and listened to it incessantly in elementary school and then have been sort of a fan ever since. So I'm sort of in that pocket of girls that were right in her target demographic. Well, I guess six is a little below the target demo at the time, but you know what I mean? It's kind of continued being a fan throughout. So I really just admire the longevity of her career, her songwriting and yeah, how business savvy she is. Have you, have you been to the, the Air Aerosol concert yet? I was, did not the voice was, I was filming the voice when she came to LA, so I couldn't come. Well, do you have plans to go see her? 
Um, I don't because I had tickets for LA that I had to get rid of, but um, hopefully soon. I have seen her before though, many times in concert. Because I've 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 heard that people should not miss out on her Eras Tour concert because it's so good. Because she performs like what a forty eight song set list every yeah every concert. yeah it would have been great, but I couldn't leave the voice, so it was no, a I, fine, no I understand it was a fine that. <laughs> No, I I I completely understand that. You know, I I I think you know, there's there's been I don't know I, this whole crazy thing with I guess like I respect Taylor fans, I respect Swifties, I understand. You know, you you love Taylor and stuff like that, but spending the money that you're spending on her concerts in general are basically your life savings. Um, I ended up getting them face value actually, so it wasn't too bad. Um, so not bad, but yeah, people will go out of their way to get those tickets for sure. I like, I like that you're getting at face value. You see, like, that's the thing with like, that's what I try to do as well when it comes to sports games. Like I try to go to the websites, like not the actual like uh, websites where they actually sell the tickets. I actually go to like secondary websites, which sell it for much cheaper than they are selling it on the real website. Um, And I get them for a pretty good discount prices. Um. Which, which is, I guess, it's always a positive thing when you're doing it that way. Um, don't always buy them immediately because the tickets go down. Like, I'm, I'm not even lying. The last minute tickets, is especially, um, you can get them for ch- much cheaper than they are when you, I guess, when you're going there. I guess on the day of the concert or a couple of days before, you'll start to see the the prices dwindle down, and much affordable prices will will appear. Um, and enough talk about uh, uh, Taylor Swift and, and those things. Um, I really want to talk about your music in general. Um, uh, I want to go through the whole discography of of, of your music. Um, you released a, a EP in 2016 called Start Again. Um, mm-hmm. Tell us about that and and walk us through the, the, the track list. How did you come to this and how was this whole EP created? Yeah, so I released that when I was 16 years old, and it was basically telling stories of what I'd experienced in the last year prior to writing that album, which I think when you're in high school, it's a lot of relationship changes and shifting dynamics and not just, um, you know, romantic relationships. But for me, it was a lot of friend dynamic changes and really coming into my own and thinking about all those different themes. So I wrote that song Um, or I wrote that album when I was in high school and yeah. And then I released it afterward and got a pretty good response. And, um, from there I knew I wanted to continue releasing even more. For sure. And, um, then you released, uh, right thing, wrong time in 2020. Then you released, I say in 2021, then you released hurricane red dress and white tab. Um, if you could, I guess, pick one song that you've released from your music um, that sort of s- speaks more volumes in terms of who you are as an artist, what song would that be? Mm. Well, I would say I really love Hurricane and the one that's on the album is just stripped down piano vocal. Uh, and so one day maybe I'd love to hear that a little bit more produced out. But um, I think the message of Hurricane really does speak to who I am as an artist and uh, but also at the same time, I really love Red Dress and White Tab. I think a lot of those those stories are ones that I really hope connect with people. Um, I want all my songs to connect with people, but, um, you know, I try and write about topics that are really true and honest, authentic to me, but, um, but, uh, but other people can relate to also. So, yeah. If you also don't mind me asking, what what is your happy place? Hmm. Um, you know, the first thing that comes to mind, I'm sure I have many because I it's probably where I feel very grounded and centered. Um, my current happy place is at my parents' house in Michigan. They have a piano in their living room, we have a fireplace, and we'll just wake up in the morning, especially in the wintertime, because it gets so cold in Michigan, and just have coffee and fire and just like hang out together for hours and be together. I think right now for me, that's where I feel the most safe and grounded and centered. As as the holidays are approaching here and uh, with Christmas just around the corner, um, 
do you have a favorite holiday song that you sort of grew up with um, that sort of just still sticks with you today? My favorite is Mary, Did You Know? That's my favorite to sing. Um, it's kind of a little bit more of a deep cut, but there's a pentatonix version that I feel like most people know. Uh, but it's a beautiful, somber Christmas song. And that's my favorite to perform. But I'm also a big Silent Night girl. I love pentatonics. I'm a big fan of their music. I, you know, that they're they're just they're they're really cool. Um, and I've I've always like sort of like really wondered. I'm like, how do people make all these sounds with their mouths? And I'm like, yeah, they're amazing. Even so like good. they don't need instruments. Like really, they really don't need any instruments with them. It's just them and their voices. And I'm like, how do you even do this? That's like, is that even yeah. human nature? Um, no pun intended there because of Michael Jackson's song. Yeah, right. Um, um, but I, I mean, it's been able to, it's been, it's been great to be able to chat with you today and and to explore, you know, everything that we did. Um, I guess if, if there's one more thing that we're gonna wrap up with, I mean, if there was one sort of artist that's already in heaven, um, that you'd want to play a song with, who would that be? What song would you play? Oh my gosh, that's so difficult. might take me a take me a second um gosh probably aretha and ain't no way that's what i would do i i, I like i like aretha and you know the uh, i was also talking with uh wendy moton uh from from the voice and she did uh the cover of ain't no way and kaylee shimizu also took on ain't no way um, yeah. I haven't I, I haven't seen that performance, so do not spill the tea on it. Um, um so um I'm I'm definitely gonna watch that. Um but well it's been it's the end of our conversation together, but thank you so much again for, for speaking with me and uh um I, I, I hope you sort of feel sort of um I don't know what the word to describe this is, but I, I hope you feel gratitude or gratified from the experience on the voice and i hope that i hope that people start listening to your music more often now and 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 i hope you sort of feel that confidence within yourself i guess mentally because i know that you still deal with the, the mental health side of it and i guess you know like as myself you know like my family has been through it and and we know what it's like and stuff like that but i i, I hope i hope you're proud of yourself and I hope you're proud of the accomplishments that you made here um but but thank you again for talking. Yeah, thanks for having me. This was really great. Thank you. Well, um, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with singer songwriter NBC The Voice season twenty four contestant Allison Albrecht. You can connect with Allison through social media, or if you want to find more info, visit allisonalbrecht dot com uh, to find out more information about her music and what she's going to be doing up next. Um, stay with her. She's got a whole lot more to to display, and uh, yes. this is this is not the end of her of, of her story here. Um, and you can connect with me on all podcast stream platforms, and you can find me on all social media as well. I've been your host, Shikni Kelting. Thanks for tuning into the show. Mm-hmm.